you're listening to sermon audio from Ankeny Free Church in Ankeny, Iowa, a community in Christ on a mission to reach our community for Christ. To learn more, head over to ankenyfree.church. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 43. Genesis chapter 43. We're going to talk today about compassion. Um, We're going to see here in this passage that the compassion of the Lord extends to the undeserving. The compassion of the Lord extends to the undeserving. Have you ever been a recipient of compassion that... Man, you just really needed it. And you were just in a, in a hard way. And someone came through. I remember this time we went to this wedding. And uh, we just had uh, Cora and Lydia. And Caroline, Carrie was pregnant with Caroline at the time. And it was an extended weekend. We went. And I love to dance with the girls. And so, you know, they're young. So I can pick them up and twist and twirl and do all these kinds of things. And then the next morning, I'm loading in our heavy luggage. And I'm reaching way into the car, awkwardly trying to wrench it into a particular way, and my back went out. And I mean went out. So I am on my hands and knees crawling back to the hotel in our room. I am sitting there, some kid, I have to wait for some kid to come to the door to open it, not my kid. And so it's like this weird, go to the bed, and I'm like boning, I'm like, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And so we managed to get loaded up. The girls have to be loaded in. They're that age. And uh, Carrie's driving, and I'm in the side seat with it down and all in this awkward position. I was just in a horrible way. It just, uh, you know, I can just feel the pity welling up inside of you, right? There with my back. And there we are outside Denison, and we get a flat tire. Oh, so... Now, Carrie, I know she's pregnant. She's totally competent and able to do stuff, but I don't know if it's bravado or pride. I'm like, I'm not having my pregnant wife. You know, I'll do it. It'll be fine. So I open the door and literally roll out onto the ground, (laughs) crawl on my hands and knees to the trunk because now i got to unload all of those things. And I'm sitting there with my hands, my one hand and my two knees on the ground, right, and trying to get these pieces of luggage out kind of, getting myself up, you know, getting the tire and the other stuff out. And because there's nothing that's open. It's a holiday weekend. There's no one we can call. There's no one that's anywhere. Nothing is open. You know, I'm crawling on the ground trying to roll or scoot this spare tire and this jack. And I'm sitting there. And the jack, that's fine because you kind of lie down anyway to do it. But once I get it up, I'm sitting there and I got to get these lug nuts off and I'm trying to, you know, get the hubcap off, laying on the ground. I'm laying on the ground because I can't. And lo and behold, this group of bikers comes by. And they're not one percenters. They're like the 99 percent, you know, the good kind. It's kind of like they're there and they're helpful. They're gracious. They're just out for a great drive on the weekend. And they go, do you need help? I was just like, I'm almost in tears. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm in a bad way. And they changed my tire. And I rolled back into the car. And we made it home. Have you ever been a recipient of compassion? Have you ever been a recipient of compassion? It changes you. It changes you. It should change us. And what we see in this passage is God's compassion towards these undeserving brothers We're in the book of Genesis. If you're not familiar with the book of Genesis, it's divided into two parts. In the first part, we see the four great events. Creation, fall, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. In the second part, we see the four great men. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and here, the last 30% of the book is the story of Joseph. And in Joseph's tale, we've seen That God doesn't oftentimes work overnight. We are in like the 22nd year of this saga. And God is still at work. And there's still things left to be undone. And we have seen Joseph go from a high place down to the pit, down to slavery, down to incarceration, down to forgotten as an incarcerated, uh, while he's in incarceration, only then to be lifted up 
lifted up out of the prison, lifted up to the second in command. And he's just saved the known world from famine. And yet we still have had nine chapters left to go. Because the question is, what about his family? And what is God really doing here through this family? And last week we saw that the brothers are beginning to show signs of brokenness and godly guilt. That the work of conviction is there among them. In this one, we're going to see God's compassion. God's compassion. As you note, as we go in, um, some of the things that we're going to see is there's going to be a focus once again on Benjamin. Benjamin's story is not yet complete. There is this question that remains, and while we see that the brothers are now becoming these honest men, things that they weren't before, there is this question of, will they do to Benjamin what they did to Joseph? And so that'll be a question that carries on um, through this chapter and next. And part of that is this weird table situation there at the end. But I think there's something going on in this passage that is helpful for us. So if you would, turn with me, and you can follow along. I'm reading out of the ESV if you have that or have an option to do that and you want to hear the same words, you can just do that or you can follow along in your own Bible. Now the famine was very severe in the land. And when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again and buy us a little food. But Judah said to them, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And if you will send your brother with us, we will go down and buy food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel said, Why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man you had another brother? (laughs) They replied, The man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, Is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? We told them what we told them was an answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, Bring your brother down? Judah said to Israel, his father, Send the boy with me, and we will rise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand shall shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would have returned now twice. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags. Carry a present down to the man, a little balm and a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double the money with you. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother, arise and go down to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may he send you back your, older bro- your other brother and Benjamin. As for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So the men took this present and took double the money with them and Benjamin. They rose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin was with him, he said to the steward of the house, Bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. The man did as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they thought, because they were brought to Joseph's house, and they said, It is because of the money which was placed in the sacks the first time that we are brought in, so they may assault us and fall upon us to make us servants and to seize our donkeys." So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house and spoke with him at the door of the house and said, O my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food, and when we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks, and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it again with us, and we have brought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put money in our sacks. And he replied, Peace to you. Do not be afraid. 
Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. And when the man had brought the men into Joseph's house and had given them water, they had washed their feet. And when they had given their donkeys fodder, they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. When Joseph came home, they brought him into the house to present him with what they had bought what they had with him and bowed down to him on the ground. And he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they said, Your servant, our father, is alive as well, and he is alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes, and he saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God, be gracious to you, my son. And then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep. He entered his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out. And controlling himself, he said, serve the food. They served him by himself and by them by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with them by themselves because Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Portions were taken from them from Joseph's table, but Joseph's portion was five times as much as any of theirs and they drank and were merry with them. Let us pray. Father, we ask that You would not give us simply humanly wisdom, that that you wouldn't simply give us little tidbits and insights, but instead, O Lord, that you would speak to us by your Spirit through your Word. So, Lord, I ask that you would use me in this moment, work in spite of me, but I pray that we would learn more about you, the God who rules over all things and who shows compassion. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're going to see God's compassion for the brothers. We know that the end of this tale is found in chapter 50, where we see that Joseph understands that the brothers did what they did. They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And there is going to be this restoration and a reconciliation that comes about. And so we get to see pieces of this as we walk slowly through this account And here today we see that they are coming back. We're immediately confronted with dialogue as to Israel saying, why did you treat me so badly as to mention I had a brother? And they're like, how could we know that we had a brother? We see that the the men are are concerned about being robbed and that their donkeys are going to be stolen. And, you know, everybody's all up up in arms about various things. And we're just kind of actually at this point kind of thankful that in verse 11 that they didn't eat the uh, pistachio nuts, the almonds, the little honey as snacks on the road. It said something there at the end. I don't know how you travel, but that would have been hard for me. But what we really see here is again this, this emphasis on what is going on in this family. The name has changed from Jacob to Israel, and it, it is the same person. But oftentimes in this account, we'll see that Jacob is emphasized when Jacob is simply a father. Israel is now going to be used because we're going to see him being the dynastic head of this then, the hope for the world in this fledgling nation. And so we'll begin to see this switch. And we actually begin to see a switch in Israel. There are some things in this passage that remind us of Jesus. I think one of the things we see right off the bat is Judah's statement that that he said that he is going to take responsibility for his brother Benjamin. Verse 8, send the boy with me. We will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we You and our little ones, I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. You may be remembering that in our last passage, 
Reuben said something kind of similar. He said, you know, I'll be responsible for Benjamin, and if he doesn't come back, you can kill my two sons. Now, this is either very pagan or, or very wicked, but even Joseph, with all, or even Jacob, with all his flaws, was like, ah, it's, it's, we're not doing this. I mean, could you imagine, you know, I'm sitting there. And my dad's telling my grandpa that if my uncle doesn't make it back, that my grandpa could kill me, you know, and my, my sibling. It'd be like, oh, I got to get out of this house. I gotta, <laughs> man, if I was the sons, I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pasture elsewhere. This is, this is crazy town. What are we doing here? And I think Jacob, Israel, saw that as well. But what Judah is saying is he's going to personally take responsibility, whereas Reuben was putting the blame on, or the penalty really on his sons. Uh, Judah's going to bear the blame. He's going to shoulder what it takes to bring Benjamin safely and to deliver them and to, to satisfy the justice that is, that is due here. That's what Jesus does for us. He, he takes our sin upon us. And he delivers us safely before the Father, faithfully. We get another picture here, and this time it's found in Israel. Abraham had a favored son, Isaac. He was the son of the promise. And God asked, are you willing to give up the son for me? And even though it doesn't play out quite the same, we see Israel's confronted with the same sort of choice. Am I going to give up my son for others? Now, Benjamin doesn't die. He makes it. He's, he doesn't get killed by someone in Egypt. He faithfully lives out his years. But God the Father was willing to give God the Son up for us. And it wasn't just a chance that Jesus would die. He actually did die. Bearing the penalty of our sin on the cross, shedding his blood, enduring the, the torture, the agony, and above all, the shame. God was not willing to withhold his son in order that he might get us. But the clear message here is about the compassion that we see. We're reminded that once again, God is in control. Verse 14, God Almighty, it's El Shaddai, the God who cares for and protects. This is the name of God used in Genesis 17 when we're talking about Abraham. The name of God used in Genesis 35 when we're talking about Isaac and Jacob. And once again, Jacob is bringing it into when we're talking through what's going to happen with Benjamin. He is acknowledging that God is in control. And what does he want God to do? It says to grant you mercy or compassion. Compassion. And, and that becomes true then. We start to see that in verse 30, that Jesus, Joseph hurried out for his compassion. Same word, grew for his brother and will eventually grow for his other brother's as well. That compassion here is, is all over the page. We see it in, in a few other places. We see here as the steward is trying to calm the brothers down that think they're going to they're gonna get robbed of their donkeys. He says, verse 23, peace to you, do not be afraid. Peace to you. Shalom lechem. It's the phrase that's still used in Israel today. It's the traditional greeting, a desire for, for wholeness and harmony. And we also see here in verse 29, Joseph's statement about his brother. Is, your youngest, is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. We're not going to see that phrase, God be gracious, until we see it again in Numbers, where Aaron gives his blessing, where it says, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you and 
be gracious unto you? The Lord's countenance lift upon you and give you peace. We have all of the elements here of, of one of the most significant blessings we find in the Old Testament, kind of mixed and woven in through this passage. This passage is indeed about compassion. Well, what's the problem? Well, in this world and in the history of the world, we don't see a lot of compassion. If you're familiar with the situation in India, Compassion International, which would fund kids in poverty and Global Fingerprints, which is the Evangelical Free Church's kind of version of that, along with many, many other organizations, have been kicked out. There's not a desire for that kind of compassionate work um, there for, for them. They don't see the need. <laughs> they have a different way of thinking about things where people are earning what they deserve in their poverty so that when they're reincarnated, maybe they'll get a better chance in the next life. No, uh, compassion, compassion in this world is based really on Jesus, on Jesus. Let me give you some examples here, some books I like. We've looked at this last time, Tim Keller, who recently passed away in his book, Forgive. He gives a brief history here of forgiveness, which ties into mercy and grace and compassion. He says this, classicist David Constant writes, the modern concept of forgiveness in the full or rich sense of the term, did not exist in classical antiquity, that is, in Greece and Rome, or in all the places, or, or in all the events that played no role whatsoever in the ethical thinking of those societies. Again, Charles Griswold, probably the most respected contemporary, who gives the most uh, respected Contemporary philosophical treatment of forgiveness says it is surprising and illuminating that forgiveness is not seen as a virtue by the ancient Greek philosophers. In another book that I like, Rodney Stark and the Rise of Christianity, we read about Emperor Julian, who was an emperor after the time of Christ. He was a pagan and hated Christians and wanted to see them destroyed. During his rule, however, there was a great plague, and he is writing about what is going on with regard to this plague. He says this, I think that when the poor happen to be neglected and overlooked by the priests, he means here the pagan priests, what was happening is people were abandoning family members and loved ones because of the disease. They would leave them to rot in their homes. They would leave them dying by the roadside. And this wasn't just true of the normal population. It was true of the priests as well. So when they were neglected and overlooked here by the pagan priests, the impious Galileans, that's his word for the Christians, impious Galileans observed this and devoted themselves to their care. He wrote this, the impious Galileans not only support their poor, but ours as well. And everyone can see that our people lack aid from us. The, the history of compassion in the world that we see has its center on Jesus Christ. In the book, The Air We Breathe by Glenn Scrivener, another great book about apologetics and really a great defense of the faith here for, for people today. He talks about compassion, and he gives an overview of compassion in the ancient world. He says, the St. Ephraim the Syrian, when the city of Edessa was ravaged by a plague, established hospitals open to all who were afflicted. St. Basil the Great founded a hospital in Cappadocia with a ward set aside for the care of lepers, whom he did not disdain to nurse with his own hands. St. Benedict of Nursia <clears throat> opened a free infirmary at Monte Cassino 
and made care of the sick a paramount duty of his monks. In Rome, the Christian noblewoman and scholar St. Fabulia established the first public hospital in Western Europe and, despite her wealth and position, often ventured out into the streets personally to seek out those who needed care. St. John Chrysostom, while a patriarch of Constantinople, used his influence to fund several such institutions in the city. This care for the poor and sick was headed up by church leaders. Charity was considered integral to the faith and duties of each Christian. With the bishops leading the way, they presided over these many welfare areas with their size and infrastructure growing further after the conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine in 312. We see that there is a history of compassion that is founded on Jesus Christ. It didn't come from, from other pagan philosophies or from classical uh, classical views of personhood. It came from Christians that saw that all people were created in the image of God. And more importantly, that just as God has loved and given us compassion, we need to give compassion to others. Well, so what? So what? So maybe we begin to see here God's compassion to us. Um, what do we need to know when it comes to compassion? And there's really two things. The first is God's compassion for us, but the second is we also need to understand God's power. God's power. Let's start with the first, God's compassion for us. You want to be compassionate? You need to understand that you are a recipient of God's compassion. God's compassion. Look, I, I love you all. We are hardworking Iowans, right? Unless you're a visitor from Nebraska or something like that, right? I don't know. I can't speak for, for neighboring states. And that's a good thing. It is a good thing. It's a good thing that you don't just sit and waller and just kind of wait for the world to come to you. But there is a downside, and that is that we believe that everything that has happened to us has happened by the strength of our arm and by the diligence of our own hard work. And that is just not the case. We are great recipients of the, the goodness and compassion of God. I mean, given the events of world history... God should have annihilated the world in judgment many times over. And instead, what has he done? He's shown goodness and grace time and time and time again. We see it generally. You were born in a time and place where you had absolutely zero choice over that. No choice whatsoever. That's why we're all here. Not because... We thought it was a good time to kind of come into the world. It's just where we're at. And we see God's blessings, right? You like the air conditioning, don't you? It's nice not to be sweltering in the heat. Uh, I, I like the fact <clears throat> that when I go to put gas in the pump, I mean, I know I'm being robbed if I'm looking at the, this, <laughs> how much it costs per gallon, but I also know that a gallon is going to be a gallon. I also know that, that what I put in is what it says it will be. I, I like going to, to eat out. And by and large, I know that they didn't grind up rat meat and dye the food to serve it to me just to save some money. That wasn't always the case, folks. It wasn't always the case. But it is the case now. I like it that a, a simple infection probably won't be the end of most of us. I, I like it that if, that if we have some serious ailments for, for many of these things, there is, there is hope and progress. I like the fact that we can, we can travel and move and we can have mangoes in Iowa. There's many great blessings that we can look at practically, like, well, God has been compassionate to us. Reading human history, I wouldn't think that this would be the actions of our sovereign Lord to make this better. But he did. But for those of us in Christ, it's even more. I used to live in a town where they did, like, they had photo traffic 
setups, right? You know what I'm saying. And so even with that, there's all kinds of signs telling you that this is happening. You know, watch out. This is going to come up. Unfortunately, I still got a few tickets in the mail of things that that went, uh, you know, I was like, oh, there I am. You know, the Lord sees every little time that the ethical needle goes over where it should in our life. Every lustful thought, every greedy notion, every time your mind is filled with envy or pride, Every time, whether you're standing in your shower or sitting on your porch, slowly destroying someone who maybe slighted you in your mind, envisioning a giant rock slide, taking them out. The Lord knows it all and shows you compassion. The Lord knows not just what you think, He knows what you have done. Every Lustful action that didn't just stop at a thought. Every mad grab for cash. Every, every time that you kind of drove yourself because of your own pride. Every time you were filled with envy and it didn't just stop in your mind, but it spilled out into words as you slowly assassinate the character of someone else. Every desire for sympathy that then garners this this ongoing kind of pitting of people to try and get someone to be on your side, that they would feel the anger that you feel. You don't care. You're just out for you. We understand God's compassion. Through Christ we have forgiveness. Simply trusting in the goodness of God, receiving then His mercy, we have forgiveness. But it's not the kind of forgiveness that sometimes we give. It's not like we can just, it's, it's not the sort of forgiveness that sort of stops it. You know, if we see the Lord at Walmart, we can say hi, it won't be weird. And we can talk to Him, say, see what's up with the kids. You know, where, where we can kind of interact and not be awkward. No, it's a much deeper forgiveness, isn't it? Instead of wrath, He gives us righteousness. Instead of leaving us alone, He makes us a temple and fills us with His Holy Spirit. And more than that, we get everlasting life with new bodies, not just to live in some country kind of far away from Him, but that we dwell forever in His very presence And it's not that this was simple. It came at the cost of His Son. His blood shed for us in order that He might be an atoning sacrifice for the evil that we've done. The Lord has shown compassion to you in a way that you cannot imagine. And we should, first of all, trust in Jesus that that forgiveness is there. And we should let that compassion transform us. 1 John 4.19, he says, We love, why? Because he first loved us. Colossians 3.12, 13 14. It, it says is this, My dearly beloved, put on compassionate hearts it's the first one right paul is saying you want to be this new person put on compassionate hearts kindness meekness humility patience bearing with one another and as each has faults towards one another forgiving one another forgive as the lord has forgiven you and above all things put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony We do this because that's exactly what the Lord has done for us. And so we should look to the compassion of the Lord to treasure it, but also to embody it as we extend compassion to others. We need to remember the compassion of God. Secondly, we also need to remember the power of God. The power of God. 
Here, Joseph understands that he is not in his position um, through his wit, through his skill, but by the goodness and grace of God. He names one of his kids that God has been gracious in the land of his affliction. He, he understands that it's not him interpreting the dream, it's the Lord that interprets dreams. He, he's, he's there, standing solidly on the work of God, not his own strength. And El Shaddai, the one who provides for all of these things, is at work. And we need to understand this power as well. Lisa Turkhurst, who is an author, writes a story that I'm sure is familiar to many of us. While she was in the fourth grade, she'd had a troubled childhood. Everything wasn't always great. But she had made a few friends until one day these two girls came up and they said, we think you're ugly and we are not going to play with you anymore. You need to go away. She was just absolutely devastated. Come to find out that these two girls wanted to be in a different circle group, the so-called popular kids. And in order for them to do that, they had to do that to her. And they were willing because what they really wanted was this validation by these other people. And it's really sad, but it happens with adults as well. When we really want something, we're willing to throw people under the bus. And the first thing to go is, compassion. You want money? (laughs) You're willing oftentimes to do whatever it takes and your heart becomes cold to the needs of others. Uh, You want prestige? You know other people. You know that their heads are meant to be stairs that you're to climb on in order that you might stand taller. Right? You, You want some sort of peace in your life? You're willing to just be discompassionate to the cries of others because what's paramount in your life is whatever little zone of harmony that you can happen in. And what you need to realize is that real power, whether it's found in wealth or or pleasure or fame or achievement or position, isn't ultimately had here in this world, but it's found in the Lord. And so we need to realize that if we really want this power, it's never going to be had by being evil, discompassionate. You aren't going to get ahead in God's economy by being ruthless to those created in His image. (laughs) And sometimes we think we see real power and we forget the power of God at work in our lives. We have an opportunity here then to kind of see this meal here brought about to conclusion. As the worship team comes forward, we're going to participate in the Lord's Supper. Don't you think it's funny, right? Joseph can't eat with his brothers because of his position. The Egyptians can't eat with the Hebrews because they think they're an abomination. And yet here we are, young and old. I know you all don't make the same amount of money as one another. I know you don't all have the same prestige in the community as one another. I know you don't all come from the same background, uh, ethnically, geographically, as one another. And yet, what is most true about us is that we are one in Christ. Brothers and sisters brought together by the blood of Jesus Christ made a new people here in this world And what we see broken up there in the pages of Genesis, and hopefully we'll see some restoration as we read on, we see most fully here in this moment right now, brought together because of the compassion and goodness of our God. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, I I invite you to just simply reflect during this time. If you're someone that's, you're a Christian, but... You are in, you're just rebellious towards the Lord and you don't want to open your heart. Maybe reflect on that as well. We don't want to do this in a silly way. But if you're someone in need of God's goodness and grace, to re- be reminded of what Christ did for us at the cross, this is for you. I'm going to lead us in a moment where we're reflecting on what God has for us. And then. I'm going to pray, we're going to read the passage, and we're going to then take the bread, 
and then we'll take the cup and afterwards we'll sing a song. Let us, let us bow our heads. Father, I ask that in this moment you would speak to us. Maybe things from Genesis 43, maybe just things that you are bringing about in our own mind. But this is, this is your time, O oh Lord. We yield it completely to you. Father, we thank you that you did not withhold your own son, but gave him up for us all. <laughs> Lord, we ask that you would help us to understand the, the depth of our righteousness that we have now in Christ, the mercy that's been extended to us, the, the compassion that you've given us through Christ's shed blood, what it means to be restored and renewed what it means then to, to walk in the power of your Spirit and to be about what you would have us be about here in this world. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us even as we take the bread and the cup together. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We pray you are blessed and encouraged by this week's message, and we invite you to join us every Sunday, in person or online, for morning worship. Have questions about what it means to know and follow Jesus? Simply email Todd at ankenyfree.church. Thanks for listening.